Hi, Dina. It's uh, great to be here with you. Um, this is really exciting to get to chat with you. I know you're in Dubai right now. Do you think you could tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you're actually doing in Dubai right now? Sure. Thanks for having me, Owen, and great to manage to catch up across time zones. So um, I'm a medical doctor by background and a healthcare entrepreneur. I work in the field of longevity, both as an investor as a, and as a scientist and a physician. Um, I am a chief science officer of a longevity research clinic based in London, launched in partnership with the Buck Institute for Research and Aging. I work on computational medicine applied to aging, and I'm a partner at the new programmable biology SALT fund, which is part of the larger SALT ecosystem. So I'm really passionate about longevity, and I like to create and support companies in this space. Here in Dubai, I'm working a bit with the Dubai Futures Foundation and their health initiative. Um, because they're also super passionate about new uh, computational approaches that can measure biological aging and how we can leverage technology to provide uh, the best possible longevity medicine. Speaking of longevity medicine, what, what is longevity medicine? Why, why should we care about longevity medicine? Well, because we have an aging population and I think longevity medicine is a new term and people define it differently. People even define longevity differently. But um, the reason why I often use it instead of preventative medicine is that preventative, we had a very good wave of preventive medicine in a way that we wanted to switch from sick care to well care. But it again, it only focuses on identifying some d disease processes early. Whereas with longevity medicine, I think it's a more 360 approach. So it immediately encompasses things like medicine as well as uh, mental health, brain health, which you know both are very passionate about, and we can yeah. hopefully chat more. Um, nutrition, fitness, and you know our environment. Um, so that is the more 360 element. And secondly, uh, while preventive medicine looks at preventing you from getting disease and catching diseases early so that you, they're still treatable. Longevity medicine works at not only kind of preventing you from getting sick, but also how optimizing you so that you can perhaps slow down or even reverse some of the biological processes of aging that make you more likely to develop disease. So for longevity medicine, and you could always probably be a better version of yourself. Whereas for preventative medicine, as long as you're fine on a checkup, you don't necessarily need to come and, and get checked for another year or two, depending on, um, you know, um, your risk factors and the nature of the disease. This idea of optimization, um, kind of the shift from, from sick care to well care, which you mentioned it is to me really fascinating. I, I see so many things popping up on LinkedIn and news articles about this, but what do you find really exciting in this space right now, this, this longevity optimization space? Well, I think um, there, there are so many things and I'm very fortunate to be part of the ecosystem and uh, work with, you know, people like you and, and many others who are trying to uh, really innovate in this space. Um, however, the, if I was to emphasize, I'd probably say that I'm personally very passionate about development of neural blocks. Um, it is very much common knowledge these days that developing surrogate biomarkers of uh, biological aging is kind of opening the holy grail of longevity. So that will allow us to conduct uh, randomized controlled clinical trials to produce type A evidence for all of these interventions that are now mostly in, in, in the biohacking space and see yeah. whether or not they slow down aging. And you know we've seen it with a bit of the setup of the TAME trial that looked at metformin, but it, you know is still. Uh, is still kind of build, building up. Um, we have seen some studies just recently of perhaps, you know, pe people who were on metformin and had diabetes were, you know, less likely to have severe COVID and then people who were not on diabetes were not on metformin, right? So there's speculative evidence that drugs like metformin, semaglutide, and, you know, many others might have an effect on longevity, but because we don't have these clocks, it's very difficult to to, to prove that. And, and, and uh, that is also a big problem of licensing aging as a disease, which, you know, a lot of us in the field believe it should be. Um, and I, the other thing what I, I, I like it, and that's why I like brain key and your measure of brain age is that 
we still don't even know if we have, you know, we believe that aging is a systemic disease and certainly this age-related immune decline and inflammation. So what happens as we age, and I use my cleaners in the house analogy that I'm happy to, to share with you. So there's certainly a systemic process that happens as we age, and that's why we have an increased risk of um, type 2 diabetes, um, atherosclerosis, dementia, many metabolic cancers. I'd probably group age-related macular degeneration in there as well. But whether or not that piece of aging happens at the same rate in, in different tissues and organs is still questionable. So whether or not we will need a couple of clocks or we'll have you know one mega clock to follow. I think it's still um, it's then still to be seen. But I quite like you know these computational approaches because then we can test all of the interventions that we currently have in our arsenal, and they range, as I said, from from pure lifestyle to to some of the medical and pharmacological interventions as well. Yeah, I, that's. I want to unpack that what you just said there. There's so much that's interesting there. There's how do you measure? Like kind of in a quantitative way, how somebody's aging, what you call is a, like a surrogate bar, biomarker for aging. It's it's the biological clock, and then within the biological clock, you've got you know brain age, heart age, liver age, or do you have some like global age? Um, you need those to measure, and then you need these therapies that are emerging to actually impact how your body is aging, but it's hard to measure how these therapies are actually working without having a really good clock. So this whole ecosystem seems to be kind of building up right now together, which is, is so fascinating how this is kind of coming along. Um, but speaking of those individual clocks, what do you feel about that? Do you think there should be a kind of a global body clock or do you need component clocks? So how do you, what do you see that coming out of that space? Well, I mean, I'd like to look at it from kind of computational medicine perspective. So I like to work with different clocks for now, um, because um, again, I feel that a lot of the way a lot of these clocks are developed is that often there is a research group or a company that is focused on a specific clock. And that is needed in order to really kind of do a deep dive into a problem and, and you know, get the data set, use some of the techniques to potentially generate synthetic data um, out of data sets and, and really develop strong markers. But what I'm really passionate about is putting all of these clocks together um, and then kind of being in the driving seat and seeing how do they correlate with each other and are they actually measuring similar disease processes. We have seen, you know, from even the Corvette of, of tissue clocks that what he has shown is that in different tissues, your chronological age is very similar, but we don't necessarily want to measure chronological age, right? We want to measure what is your risk of developing disease? What is your risk of developing multimorbidity? And what is, you know, how can you revert it? We want the clock to be dynamic enough so that if you start meditating or if you quit smoking or if you start, if, you know, you go on a, on a regular time restricted eating or a fasting program that you be able to see a change. So it has to be dynamic and um, it, it has to be responsive to a lot of these changes. Therefore, I am my kind of really passion is putting all of these clocks together and seeing what they mean. It seems that um, initially, from from just going back to kind of central dogmas of molecular biology, that a lot of it would be perhaps like a transcriptomics or a proteomics clocks because it does tell us, you know, what is actually getting. Um, produce and function so not just the genetics and the epigenetics sure. but this is very preliminary um, and there are multiple other groups uh, working on it and really my job is to kind of connect all of these clocks uh, apply it see what in, what they're sensitive to what they're not um, and, and fine-tune them so that potentially we could get the mega clock and prevent the field and the leading players in the field to work in silos because um, I think we do need to work on this together in order to be able to develop this mega clock, which is going to help us drive the field further. <laughs> it should be a, some new startups name. It's the mega mega clock. I don't know. Uh, aging is a systemic disease. Maybe taking a step back, why? What is what is happening when somebody's aging? And so the, when you're talking about all these different clocks. Um, just if you're not a molecular biologist, why, what does that mean? Why, why are we looking at these different versions of aging 
and and why should that matter and what's happening to our body as we age I, I know that's such a big thing but but i'd love to kind of get a better understanding of that from you yes well i mean i would just say that there's there's it's a very complex disease process and um, so far, we have identified like, you know, the, the hallmarks of aging, and I certainly believe that it's very closely interlinked to the immune system. So our body just becomes not that great at removing the, you know, the, the dead cells, inactivating cells, um, kind of this, you know, we just don't clean our house as efficiently so that manifests in different rooms differently you know in the bedroom you start collecting dust and that causes you to cough in the kitchen you start forgetting you know that the fire is on and you um you end up with a fire in the kitchen because you were cooking and you know, did not um, handle it properly but it's you know neither the cough suppressant nor the fire extinguisher that is going to help reverse that it's really kind of reorganizing this cleaning schedule in the house and that is a bit what happens with you know our immune service surveillance and it's closer link with thymus uh, generation and uh, some shifts in the immune cells, particularly certain T cells. Um, however, you know, we now have this, we have this nine hallmarks of aging, we might have more. I do not think that aging per se is still a well studied process and we're learning every time. Like we know that we accumulate this, what we call zombie cells or senescent cells as we age. But recently, you know, a group that uh, I closely work with has shown that actually this and the lower burden of these zombie senescent cells might be associated with higher cancer risk, right? Um, so it's still a very poorly studied field and we're just learning about the biology. Um, so what I would say is that there's certainly some process that happens as we age. Some of these processes, you know, with antagonistic pleiotropy of aging, some of these processes are protective, but at the point, you know, they're maybe optimizing us for reproduction, but at the point they become malfunction and then we start, we start aging and we start developing chronic disease. So what we want is that we want to study these processes further so that we can develop novel targets and potentially reverse that process. The reason why I'm passionate about longevity is that, you know, people define longevity differently, but I look at it as a function of good health over time. So we have an aging population and people, you know, most people are likely to develop a chronic disease, you know, depending on where they live. And obviously this depends on many factors and socioeconomic factors and, you know, the country you live in and even in the same city that the, the, the borough you live in. But uh, the idea is that, you know, most people develop a chronic disease, you know, sometimes in their 60s and most people are going to live, you know, sometimes to their 80s. Yeah. So the vast majority of us are going to expect to spend 10 to 20 years of um, living with chronic conditions and often it's with poor quality of life. Therefore, um, longevity really talks about this compression of morbidity. So how can you, you know die as uh, old as you can, as young as you can? And I think that is really important for productivity in our society um, for um, the way we make life decisions. And um, in, in general, just feeling really good and passionate about our health and the way we, you know, contribute to the science in, in, in the world. Obviously, by extending that, you know, by compressing morbidity, and, you know, if you don't, if you prevent like the five um, con chronic conditions that are most likely to kill you, it is highly likely mathematically that you're going to expand your lifespan. And certainly when it comes to lifespan, we're looking at other things. We're looking at potentially um, regulating these processes. And that is where all this computational stuff comes in. So it seems that, you know, cellular aging is very, you know, it's a very kind of timely regulated process. So if we could potentially, you know, either through using some of the Yamanaka factors initially, but then to induce some cells into, into pluripotent stem cells, but then use computational approaches to then from that stem cell tell the cell with, you know, using computational approach to tell us what transcription factors to expose it to, to differentiate into another mature cell type. Um, in their projects like a Chromecat project from one company in base in Boston. So 
Um, there are things like potentially using messenger RNA to switch and put the APOE allele, the longevity allele that is important for longevity. So I think the whole there's this whole new field which is still very at its embryonic stage but it's kind of looking how can we you know use this programmable biology and reprogram the cellular aging with you know tweaking the epigenetic the genetic code and tell kind of tell the cell oh no you're not this old you should be that cell or you know you should be 35 instead of 50 and that is um that is like a almost separate to this kind of longevity and it really focuses on health span um, but it kind of requires different approaches and it's a bit further away from full translation in the clinic, but it's as exciting. Yeah. There's aging. What I'm hearing is, is aging is really complex and there's a lot we still don't know about aging, but, but that's something we can all recognize individually is that, you know, we, we see our own bodies age, we see others age, we see people we love around us age. Um, you brought up a point around good quality of life. So it, those last 10 to 20 years, if you're still functional, but uh, or you're still alive, but you're not as functional as you'd like to be, you're not as young as you'd like to be, um, is a big issue that uh, we hear come up a lot as well. Um, so I really like that focus of, of keeping people as young as possible you know, as, as old as possible. So as an individual, I know there's so much coming out right now, but if, if I want to live to hundred and that's my goal right now, what, what should I be doing to, to try to maintain that, um, to keep myself as young as possible? Well, I mean, to, to be fully honest, it really depends on, on the person and, you know, we all kind of have strategies and, in different approach, but it really is looking after yourself and, and trying to um, do this whole preventative lo and, and longevity medicine to get your best chance. Um, you certainly are doing very well because you're you're keeping up to intellectual stimulation. You're going for um, regular medical checkups. Um, you are you have measured your brain age um, and have even uh, <laughs> so perhaps you know I, I could ask you have you seen your your brain age changing uh, with uh, any of the interventions you have you have done. Have you like managed to reverse your brain aging? Because that could be also an interesting step towards your your longevity. And then I can tell you what I do. Yeah, that's that's another concept that's really fascinating. Is um, to me, aging in and of itself is not necessarily bad. Like um, especially when you talk about the brain, like a brain at at fourteen, and a brain at you know thirty five, and a brain at fifty. Each of those brains has a computational advantages over you know, the other one. So it's not necessarily that you want a brain that's, you know, 15. Yeah, yeah, you don't want the pruning adolescent phase again and, and going through all those mood swings, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's uh, it gets so com complex and individual when you talk about these things. But um, as me, that's something I've seen. My, my brain is aging, it is changing over time. I'm fortunate enough in a, to be in a position where I'm able to get myself an MRI scan. Um, I'm able to look at the data and understand it. Uh, the company I'm building, BrainKey, helps patients actually view their MRI data, um, computationally understand it, and have it in a format they can track it over time. So that's something that's super exciting for us. And we want to make this as easy as possible for people to really be able to do. Um, but, but looping back into what you're saying, you know, what is do I want to reverse my brain age? Do I want to go back in time? Um, I don't want to be like that idiot 15 year old I was again, but at the same time, I don't want my brain age to be like 65 uh, when I'm you know, my age now. I, I want it to be right around what my age is now, maybe a few years younger might be ideal, but um, I'm not gonna like hit the fountain of youth and go back from you know being 65 back to you know 20 that's okay and that's that's great there's advantages there i guess what's what i do personally is a combination of intellectual stimulation that's just curiosity driven so talking to somebody like you is really fascinating you're bringing up um 
like uh, molecular biology vocabulary I don't haven't heard you know all the time and it's it's fascinating so that's just making my brain fire and stay on top of things um, physical exercise is incredibly important to me um, that's something we we've started working with different groups to actually see how these interventions practically impact somebody's age brain age and different areas of their brain um, so if you're doing a therapy, you want to know how that's actually impacting it. So that's what you were talking about. These clocks are so important to see how your brain is going to be changing or your body is changing in response to a therapy. Nobody wants to go out and do a bunch of things that take a lot of effort and are not having an impact on you. Um, so that's really interesting and, and something we're building out now. What do you, what are you doing? Do you see this as something you're actively thinking about for yourself or are you really thinking about it for like your parents or your grandparents? Oh no, well, I, I would definitely say that I'm greedy and I certainly try to try to practice what I preach. And I think everybody, you know, I, I'm, I'm a medical doctor and I think everybody could benefit from the field at least to an extent. And that is why I make the differentiation between health span and, and lifespan. Um, so that we do not overpromise in the field that you know a lot of what we have right now and it may not enable you to live to 130 um, but you know it might because we know the path physiology of the chronic conditions it will very likely you know enable you to have you know lower uh, number of years spent with, with suffering from chronic disease which i think is a very good argument to to get interested in the field um no with when it comes to kind of the, I guess the basics of your the pre preventive longevity and longevity medicine is obviously you know you're only as strong as your weakest link. So um, having a regular checkup and uh, a full body MRI, then depending on the risk factors and um, age, by you know being a very strong risk factor for many diseases. Um, focus screening, so whether it's breast or cervical for women and, you know, a one-off colonoscopy, you know, after the age of 50. Um, so it's kind of this regular that, then um, I guess blood work, which should be probably once or twice a year. Um, you know, you should know your, your vitamin D and your cholesterol, potentially even things like ApoB. Um, and then um, certainly physical exercise in, in a way that, that works for people. So it's obviously there's many types of exercise and I like to group it um, that have been associated to have different benefits. So I, you know, just zone two exercise, right? That lower exercise when you can talk and main, speak in full sentences seems to be important for longevity, fat burning, then obviously a bit of cardio, which because we know about the association of VO2 max and longevity, and likewise, you know, some balance uh, and, and resistance training as well. So I guess a light combination of exercise. I'm a very amateur sports person. Um, I was a big nerd in school and, you know, was always trying to miss, you know, PE to, to do extra math. And then I realized that actually in order to be fit and think well and be happy, um, one needs to exercise. Um, certainly, I'm a big a proponent of brain hit just like we have body hit, brain hit. And although people are still skeptical about it at, at times, and um, I think that, and that's why I really like uh, brain age, is that just like when we looked at uh, type 2 diabetes, right? If you look at end stage, very late stage type 2 diabetes, when people are on insulin, and then you try to, you know, give them weight loss um, program, um, you know, you're not going to reverse all of the damage because they already have chronic kidney disease, they have peripheral neurology, they have diabetes retinopathy, they probably have suffered from heart disease. Um, so there it's not a cure, right? But if you start with someone who's got pre-diabetes or, you know, just in a continuous glucose monitor is shown to have some spikes and, and lows, um, then yeah, you can reverse the process completely. So I do believe that, you know, having an, an interest um, and um, growing your interest, practicing your brain is just is just good for for function preventing functional decline um, very early and you know would love to see as an experiment and that's what we we're using you know brain key and brain age in the clinic as well to see whether or not doing such things is going to have an impact on at least slowing down um, or not accelerating your rates of brain aging. Um, apart from that, obviously, I take some supplements that that I need to take. 
Um, at the moment, I take NMN, uh, which is the one I'm passionate about, and it seems to to, to work well uh, for Where's me. That and NMN. So it's a, an NAD donor, and NAD is kind of a, a cellular energy, and it declines with aging. Um, it's important for many enzymes, including uh, sirtuins, which we know regulate some of the cellular processes, also for enzymes called PARPs that kind of fight um, cancer. Um, and in animal models, has been shown to, to reverse aging, um, similar to some of the like ketones that we produce during fasting. Um, so um, it's a very low side effect profile tested. So it's one of those that, that I take. I, I don't personally take metformin yet, but I do a continuous glucose monitor about twice a year. Um, so I, I try to check that, you know, whether or not I am still relatively metabolic flexible. Um, at times I try to do time restricted feeding either late or early, depending on which time zone I am. Um, I still struggle with full day fasts, um, but um, kind of, 18 hours uh, seem to be okay. And I think a fasting mimicking diet is, is a better way forward for me. And it's kind of really combining it and looking at, as I said, in this uh, 360 approach, I've done my whole genome, my polygenic risk score. So I know a bit what I'm predisposed at and kind of can tackle that a bit more. And that was certainly valuable in terms of the family history. Um, and then I guess where I see, to answer your kind of second part of your question with, with brain age, I mean, I've done my brain age. This is my 3D printed brain that you kindly provided me with, so I can bring it to, to you know appear smarter. Um, I when I was in med school, I went to actually a neuroanatomy competition, so I was you know looking at brains for like three months preparing for it. Um, and Susan Standring, the editor in chief of Grey's Anatomy, she was one of the judges. It was it was a very hardcore event for me. So it, it returned the, it turned the memories to remember the precentral gyrus and uh, all of the somatic maps. Um, but um, I think you know, and my brain is actually a couple of years older. Um, but what I would like to know is that, particularly in this biohacking community and you know in longevity clinics, um, people are interested. How can you know we we optimize our brain? How can we optimize our brain health, cognition, and performance? So things like, as you said, exercise, and we know that spending outdoor exercise is more effective for mild and moderate depression um, than antidepressants, right? Like we have good evidence for that, but is there a factor that is produced in the blood? How does it affect your brain age? Does this brain hit and intellectual stimulation um, pr prevent function? That would be interesting. What is brain hit or body hit you mentioned? Yeah, so it's like, you know, high intensity um, interval training. So okay, got it. You, you stimulate your, your brain with things that you like. So I, I, I kind of do some, some math because obviously I like computational medicine. So I try to do some math that I don't understand or I play with certain things like, you know, GANs and read about machine learning. And I feel like, oh my God, I understand 10% of this, but you know, it's, it's a bit of a brain burst and right. brain hit. Um, and then things like modafinil, um, things like even nicotine patches, things like certain B vitamins, even things like NMN. Um, certainly there have been papers that our, our brain is plastic, so it responds to things like meditation, mastering one's breathing, um, spending time. I certainly believe a lot in, you know, human connection as well and spending time, you know, with um, doing things you doing things you love or with the people you love. Um, how does it affect, you know, your psychological aging? Um, I'm combining brain age with things like photo age are, are the two correlated for, you know, um, people who drink a lot of alcohol. We know that alcohol definitely over a long period of time causes this global um, kind of shrinking of the brain with the gyri and increasing. So, you know, I guess, you know, you could see whether or not you're drinking too much and you have accelerated brain aging. And the reason why I like brain age is because you have actually tried to validate it. Now you were able to do so because you found that Scottish registry, which I think was following people from 1936, but you have shown in a, in a data set um, that actually brain age when performed in midlife is you know, can predict with this very good level of accuracy, functional decline in your 80s. So to me, as you know, as a physician, unlike a lot of these clocks that, you know, have been developed on, on good data models, but I, I personally still do not know for 100% what they mean in the sense that I'm not able to make a decision solely on them. So I can combine different clocks, I can combine the blood work, um, we can combine, you know, what the, what the patient is saying, and perhaps, you know, 
think about and discuss. But with brain age, you know, you have shown that it correlates with functional declines. So even though it may, we still don't know if it's going to, you know, prevent Parkinson's disease or prevent uh, Alzheimer's disease, we still know that it's very important for your function. And in the end, that is what we want, because as you said, with aging, you know, what Daniel Levitin has been working in, a lot of people, you know, do not acknowledge is that as we age, we tend to be happier and uh, we're less anxious. We're more at ease with ourselves. And that's why, you know, putting in a bit of effort and uh, trying to keep the, the other function those can be you know the best years of the best years of your life or you know the really really exciting periods and there's so many problems that we need to solve on the way particularly female reproductive longevity that uh, i recently got involved with but i think it's it just changes the way how we plan our lives and how we can contribute to the society um therefore it's you know this function you know we, we will likely be happier and um, we can work on some of our functional status and, uh, you know, with measures that hopefully are, you know, over time going to become more um, synchronous and more readily available um, to the general public, we can probably prevent a lot of the chronic conditions. So I think we're going in the right direction and, you know, people like you are really driving the effort. So um, it's really a pleasure to, to work with you. I mean, we're, we're, this is impacting, the, the population is aging, the population is living longer than ever. Um, this is a major issue. Our parents are, are living longer than any any generation ever, and when we want to see them doing well for a long time, um, we want them to be productive. We uh, are selfish, you know. Our generation is 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 notorious for that. So we want this for ourselves as well. But uh, you brought up something so interesting: is we also want things individualized, like you mentioned you were a nerd in school like exercise wasn't like necessarily your thing um i think that's fascinating because we do know different things can have a very good effect on an individual um, intellectual stimulation we hear these different games are positive or yoga or mountain climbing or like puzzle solving um but maybe you don't need to do everything maybe you do things that are interesting for you uh, I, I really like this idea of an individual approach. Um, I know when we're company building, we always, we want something that's mass distributed for everybody. Um, but that's, we're kind of getting more and more towards an individual world. So these type of individual solutions and individual measurements are so fascinating. Is, uh, and the other thing you touched on is, is happiness. I think is fascinating. You wouldn't think happiness is in a conversation about longevity, but I mean, why do you want to live forever if you're depressed and, and, and in a terrible state? So that's, uh, how do you, do you want to touch on that a little bit more? How do you feel like that fits into this picture? Well, many, many good questions. Um, certainly have the one on, on psychological age and happiness. Again, thanks to my incredible research collaborators. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, there has been a very credible JAMA paper that shows that being happy is, uh, you know, very important for your longevity. And I think it adds like 10 years off of good life expectancy. Um, there has been um, also a, a recent paper by a good collaborator and colleague of mine, uh, Alex Javoronkov from Deep Longevity and in Silica Medicine, um, where they've developed this thing called uh, PsychAge. And it's a really easy questionnaire that you can do online um, and answer questions like how old do you think you feel you know how do you believe your your life is going to be in 10 years and then just that perspective um can be is associated with you know your risk of developing some some chronic conditions and your your, your life expectancy so certainly keeping that positive attitude um i think it's very important and um in the end it's just you know, the, the most important thing is how your personal perception, right? Like you want to perhaps in, implement some elements of fasting to have the, you know, autophagy. So this process where we eat all of these dead zombie cells and, and get rid of things that can cause cancer. Um, you want to maintain a healthy way to prevent metabolic disease, but you also want to want to enjoy, right? Like eating and eating with, you know, your, your loved ones. So it, it is right. It's about finding that balance and in the end making happy. And I think one trick that, you know, I am still struggling with, and I think it is really is a trick that we 
should all try and do is to learn how to love things that make you feel good and that are good for you. And I think that really is, is a really important step for doing all of this longevity. So often we kind of tend to love things that are kind of very short term and, oh, this is like a quick fix. So let's, you know, let's get drunk. Let's, you know, binge eat. I, I don't drink alcohol, but for, for my brain age, but, you know, I, I love cake and chocolate. So it's often, you know, finding that, um, that balance that actually you derive pleasure from things that are good for you long term. So I think that is the one step and it's different for everyone. And then the other thing that you mentioned is personalization. So the way I look at it is that I kind of look at it as, as a, a set of boxes that you want to kind of tick in a way, but they're different for me, they're different for you, and they're different for um, for each individual in a sense that is exercise good for you? Yes, you know, you should do some level of exercise. Maybe it's a 30 minute walk, maybe it's, you know, going up and down the stairs, maybe it's a bit of a bike ride, but moving is going to help your, your brain, your, your mental health and your physical health. So exactly, you know, it could be more extreme for someone, it could be less, but doing some form of that. Um, again, is some form of intellectual stimulation good for you? Probably yes. Is, you know, maintaining a, a healthy metabolic uh, state good for you? Yes. Is, you know, getting regular health checkups good for you? Obviously, as long as it prevents medicalization and, you know, um, fear of, of, of these things, but being doing it at a certain regular level is is probably good for you is um you know practicing good preventative medicine with vaccine safe vaccines good for you yes so there are a couple of these things that you know taking supplements of the things you're deficient in optimizing your nutrition optimizing your sleep trying to sleep you know the number of hours that make you feel rested yeah, those are the things that are good for you. So I think what what is the challenge, and that is why um, this kind of new era of, of longevity physicians and longevity health professionals, they can kind of become managers of all of that for people to help them create. But really it's, you know, people who are, you know, with availability of things like brain age, which I hope will become, you know, direct to consumer with, you know, things like Aura Ring um, that, you know, I'm wearing here so we people will get empowered to measure more of their things and they will learn what is best for themselves and how to combine and create their own longevity programs so we fully agree it is personalized but i think there's some building blocks that we all want to get ticked in, in a way that that works for us and it's you know important for our interests it's it's an amazing space and it's evolving so quickly and just to hear about how you're thinking about this has been so much fun and, and really a fantastic conversation and intellectual stimulation. I, I hope I feel my brain really uh, alive, which is is great. And um, so thank you so much for this conversation. This has been really fascinating. So I uh, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, looking forward to chatting again.